103.8. Joe Cornish, it's a real pleasure to be in your company. Thank you so much for coming over. And because I know these tours, they can be quite grueling and intense, but I was hoping that maybe in the time that you had here in Dublin that you might get to go to Wicklow, which isn't too far away, because that's where Excalibur was shot. Well, yeah, I mean, it's very significant because uh, this is where John Borman lives, right? That's right, yeah, it doesn't live and too far away. His yeah. 1981 movie, Excalibur, is the best Arthurian movie ever made, mm-hmm. uh, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, the way it's lit, the performances, the atmosphere. Uh, inc- it's an incredible movie, and um, I'm a massive fan of all his stuff, in fact. So I was thinking, man, we should have really got in touch with him and tried to meet him while we were here. But uh, I dropped the ball on that one. I'd love for him to see it. Yes. Because uh, it was also the, the, the Clive Owen version, the, the Jerry Bruckheimer movie. Right. That was actually shot in and around Wicklow as really? well. It seems to be like the go-to spot, actually, for, uh, for King Arthur Flicks. Because this film has been fermenting, this idea has been fermenting with you for a long period of time. And you've been so busy. And I followed your work from the Channel 4 days with yourself and Adam. Uh-oh. And, uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> and it's... Uh, but like to get this off the ground, Joe, because uh, with Attack the Block, you were busy then with Ant Man and Tintin, of course, and there's other few project uh, projects on the on the periphery as well. So how did it all come come into place with the kid who would be king? Well, you're right that after Attack the Block, I went straight into writing Ant Man that I'd started before Attack the Block, and Edgar and I worked on that till 2014, till he stepped away from that, and I wrote a couple of other things to keep myself busy while I was doing that. I got attached to a couple of projects to other people's scripts that didn't get over the finish line, which is quite common. Mm -hmm. And then I figured, well, if I've got an opportunity to make something bigger, why not do something of my own? And this was an idea that I'd had since I was 12. I thought about it in massive detail over the many years since then. Uh, So I started work on this in about 2015. And from writing it to financing it to making it, post-producing it, brings us up till now. Time flies when you're having fun, right? And just getting the cast as well, because you've got Andy Stark's son in there as yeah. well, uh, Louis. Do you, because I remember hearing a, a, an interview before with uh, Richard Donner when he's making The Goonies, where he felt mm-hmm. like a camp counsellor at the time. And, you know, when you're working with young children, I don't know if, if, if you had conversations with Andy in advance, where, because you know, this is his son's first big project yeah. as well. So and he was like a dad, and you've become almost like a surrogate fatherly type. So what's that all like then dealing with Andy just prior to shooting? Andy is a lovely guy, mm-hmm. and he was there quite a bit. He was pretty busy, I think, in fact. Mm-hmm. So uh, Louis' mum, Lorraine, was there, who's also an actress. Uh, they were just really supportive. Mm-hmm. You know, making movies is, is hard work. You've got a limited amount of time, a bunch of shots you've got to get in that time. Mm-hmm. When you're working with actors who are under 16, you've got even more limited hours. Mm-hmm. So there's not a lot of um, chit-chat going on. Mm-hmm. It's just absolutely driving towards getting the shots you need to do that mm-hmm. day. And, you know, Andy would understand that and he would be there behind the camera. But it was brilliant to be able to talk to him, to pick his brains, to have his support it was fantastic. I'm a big fan of your, yourself and Adam and listen to Adam's uh, podcast quite regularly and uh, just listening to his Christmas one. And there was mm. that lovely little moment where he did ask you, he goes, like, am, I, am I in the film? And you could like, oh, yeah, yeah, I didn't, I didn't cut you out. And uh, I, like, but seeing Adam, it was great. And uh, what is it like, though, working with such a close pal like that, you know, with those sort of scenes? Do you have to give Adam much direction or anything like that? Yeah, I do. Adam <laughs> desperately needs my direction. No, it's, it's lovely to be able to mm. put him in. And I feel mm. uh, I'd get such heat from the podcast listeners if I didn't. <laughs> um, but, you know, he's a re- as you know, he's a really brilliant comedian and actor. Mm. And I, I always feel I'm not using him well enough. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And one day I'd love, to, I'd love to make something with him where he properly shows what he can do because he's kind of uniquely funny, right? Oh, he's, he's an absolute champ. Like he, he, out of ed- everyone I've met in my life, he makes me laugh harder and longer than anybody else. And it would be great to find a way to, 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 to give him a part that would use that. When he was roaring at the kids as they were just running off into Stonehenge, I just kept thinking of the pair of you and Taffin and just the yes. way you guys rinsed that <laughs> film, <laughs> which was absolutely brilliant. Yeah. But um, again, just with getting um, work on such a big production like this, Joe, did it worry you seeing the what happened to Guy Ritchie's King Arthur and sort of almost a bit of a sea change when it comes to classic characters like with Robin Hood and King Arthur, how a film like your own would play? Mm. Well, yeah, I agree that, um, you know, there have been some versions of the Arthur legend that maybe didn't 
you know, work as well as the makers hope, hope they would, but this is very different because it's modern. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to be perfectly honest, I find historical King Arthur movies a little bit boring. Mm -hmm. Borman's Excalibur being the exception. It needs to have the mysticism about it. Well, Borman's Excalibur is like a science fiction movie. Mm -hmm. It's set so far in the past that it might as well be in the future. Mm -hmm. And this is a contemporary movie. You don't really need to know much about Arthur or care that much <laughs> to be interested in this movie because it just takes the basic premises, the sword in the stone, the lady of the lake, Merle in the round table, and transposes them into, into the modern world. So it's a, it, it's a big action adventure movie for modern kids. It's not an old muddy rain and castles and medieval tedium movie. Well, I know myself, even I've got a five-year-old boy and like, he watches The Goonies now and like he's... He's even quoting it, and I just thought, which is kind of mad. Like, these films, they can, they have a real special place for for, for children um, as well. Like looking ahead now, Joe, because you've worked with so many incredible people, like over the last few years, like being in the company of of Spielberg and Peter Jackson, and there's a, that great Doodle story about Tom Cruise. If no one has heard it, which you kind of, <laughs> which you have gotten great mileage out of over the last few years as well. But like, what are you picking up for certain filmmakers as well, like Spielberg? You know, going into a production like The Kid Would Be King. Well, I think you just realize how hard guys like that work, you know, and how seriously they take it and how dedicated they are and how brilliant at negotiating the industry they are, mm -hmm. you know, as producers and directors. It's amazing to be on a set when Spielberg's directing to, 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 to feel the atmosphere around him, mm -hmm. how if someone's moving a piece of the set and he speaks, that person will freeze. You know, the, 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 the reverence and the respect that directors like Peter Jackson or Stephen get is really inspiring. And how quickly they work. You know, ev 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 everything about those guys is, uh, is, is educational, especially on Tintin. Like, t like Spielberg's amazing at blocking, right? Mm -hmm. He'll stage a scene like where one director will do close-up cut, 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 cut. Spielberg will just move the camera between those four things without cutting. Mm. So, so to see him do that on Tintin, where the camera was virtual, and he didn't even have the dolly or the crane or the equipment to limit him, mm -hmm. was was incredible. Yeah. So it was. Uh, yeah. It was. Uh, I was very, very lucky to be a small part of it. By the time you've you've wrapped on the kid who would be king, was there a parts of you kind of go? What did you learn about yourself as a filmmaker? Were there sort of new attributes that you felt you developed along the way? Well, I was pleased to get to the end and execute satisfactorily mm -hmm. <laughs> a bigger movie because mm -hmm. after attack the block i got offered or approached about quite a few big studio movies mm -hmm. but i didn't really feel i had the experience under my belt to to pull them off without possibly getting into trouble you know what i mean mm -hmm. so it was great to do something on a bigger scale with big battles big crowd scenes mm -hmm. special effects chases pyrotechnics bigger name actors because for me, that's a, that's a step towards, you know, making even bigger stuff. Because like that, you now can ha you ha handle a big canvas. You know, you look at stuff like Attack the Block and you can see elements of John Carpenter about it. And then you look at this and it's, you know, there's a, there's a lot going on here as well, Joe. Like, what if a big sort of potential franchise came your way? I, I don't know whether it be Marvel or even they're trying to make Escape from New York at the moment. It's like Carpenter stuff's back in vogue. Would you want to step into that type of territory or do you still want to kind of forge no no stuff i want to write and direct my own stuff well it's tough you've got to look at the uh, at the business really and the, as everyone knows the middle has been sort of squeezed out mm. so people are either working in much lower budgets or they're working with vast budgets and the most the, the, the vast majority of big budget movies are sequels franchises or brands mm. So I think you've got to, like, like, I would love to do something that big because those are the movies I love. I love them. I grew up with them. There's nothing better than a really good, big, spectacular blockbuster, right? Mm -hmm. But it's a question of finding a property or a material or a subject that I really feel I could um, do justice to, you know what I mean? And, mm -hmm. and, and that I'm the guy to, to do it. Because mm -hmm. I don't, like, I've been lucky in everything I've done to have a bit of authorship. Yes. And I don't think I'd be that good if I was just sort of um, phoning it in, you know? So finally, finally, Snow Crash, is that next? No, that we're developing as a TV mm. show, so mm. that's actually still in, in development. That was a screenplay I wrote for Paramount mm. right after Attack the Block, and that's now sort of morphed into a, mm. 
into a TV show, um, but you know, just a prospective one. It hasn't been uh, commissioned yet, but I don't know what's next, really. I've got some stuff I'm writing. Great stuff. And I, whatever I do, I just hope to make it a bit sooner mm -hmm. than the gap between the last two. Spin. 1038.